What's up, everybody? Welcome to another Raid Shadow Legends video. Today we have a brand new set of October champions added to the game. We have the Fusion, we have a brand new Void Legendary, and then we have a couple champions, one Epic and one Rare, that can be used to fuse the Fusion. So they'll be coming out and be in today's uh, tournaments and events and stuff like that. So I've already gone over Marinix in a separate video. I don't want to go over her too much, but I will briefly go over her really fast. Uh, she has a pretty cool A2, which gives you the Hex debuff and decreased defense on the same skill, which is pretty unique. And then she has basically the unkillable and shield ignoring A3 here if the champion is under, or enemies are under a Hex debuff. And then it places unkillable on this champion if there's actually a death when they use the A3. So, you know, not sure exactly where she'll line up for you guys, depending on where you're at in the game, if you pulled her. Um, if you've got an early level account that just started, don't have a nuker, you're probably going to be using her for the A3. I suggest go grabbing a War Maiden for the decreased defense. And uh, that's your team right there. That could last you throughout the arena, low-level arenas for a little while. Um, I'm not sure exactly how good this A3 will be. I haven't seen the multipliers on it yet. Uh, the A2, it seems like she can be a setup champion for other Hex nukers who can also come and you know, nuke waves down just in case... Uh, they didn't die the first time. Seems unlikely in the arena, stuff like that. Uh, so maybe, you know, a, a nuker or a setup nuker for someone like Cleopteryx or Thea the Tomb Angel or Rule the Huntsmaster. Um, so I'm not sure exactly where you'll be able to use her. I think when it comes to the high-level arena, she's not going to be being used for the A3 as much as uh, maybe the A2. So, you know, I'm not sure where I'll use her. There's not a whole lot of hex teams at the moment that are really like meta. Next, we have Fortis. He's a legendary Void Defense Knights Revenant Faction Champion. Looks very cool. Looks a lot like Cthulhu or something from H.P. Lovecraft's uh, novels. Maybe somebody uh, like uh, Davy Jones from Pirates of the Caribbean. Do you not fear death? So he's definitely got those Candorphon vibes going on. Go over to A1 real quick. Taste of Oblivion. Attacks one enemy has a 35% chance of placing a fear debuff for one turn. The attack will always be critical if the target is under a fear or true fear debuff. Then A2, Hordes Beyond, attacks all enemies, has an 80% chance of placing a fear, sorry, true fear debuff for one turn. This debuff cannot be resisted by targets under fear debuffs. Then Astral Tears, A3, attacks all enemies, will ignore 30% of each target's defense against targets under fear or true fear debuffs. Attack is always critical against targets under fear or true fear debuffs. Damage of this skill increases by 10% every time a fear or true fear debuff is placed on an enemy. The skill is a 40% chance to be unlocked for one turn whenever a fear or true fear debuff is placed on an enemy. This is a secret skill, a lot like um, Sky Piercer used to be, or Peril. Um, seems to be, pr I mean, this looks like it's going to be pretty cool on paper. Uh, we'll definitely have to go over the multipliers and uh, see how it plays out in practice. But so far, two things about this stand out to me. One is going to be very hard to build a team to get this to be like fully maximized. And number two, it seems like it could be very damaging on paper. We'll go over the rest of it later. The passive effect, stars align, increases the chance of enemy skills failing by 15% when those enemies are under fear or true fear debuffs. That is in addition to 50% base. So that's 65% in total. Then the active effect prevents this champion's death and keeps him alive on one HP when hit by a fatal hit, then removes all buffs and debuffs in this champion. After preventing this champion's death, fully heals them and fully depletes their turn meter. Ooh, that's bad. Then has an 80% chance of placing a fear debuff on all enemies for one turn. Finally, places a sleep debuff on this champion for one turn. This debuff cannot be resisted or blocked. So, let's go over that. It's a lot. They get hit to one. He gets hit to one HP. He removes all buffs, debuffs. Fully heals. Fully depletes turn meter. Tries to place a fear on all the enemies. And then goes to sleep. For one turn. Now, I mean, you're expecting that either the whole enemy team gets feared, so they skip their turn as well as you skip your turn, and then you come back around. Now you have like everybody starting fresh from scratch. We all know that's exactly how we we want it to work in practice, but that's not how it will work in practice. Like on paper, it seems cool, but then reality is those fears aren't going to land. Those guys are going to get their turn. You're going to go to sleep. They're probably going to nuke you back to death again. <laughs> You know, and um, breaking the sleep probably is not going to be that beneficial. Now, him being defense-based 
gives him a, an advantage there. So maybe he's tanky enough not to die. But, um, you know, it, it seems kind of like a wonky passive there. Um, I like the additional 15% to the fears and true fears part. But the rest of it, besides the fact, I mean, I do like it. I love it, actually. It's like a built-in revive on death, kind of, without the, um, I guess, negative ramifications of, like, low HPs. Uh, but the low turn meter really kind of hurts it. And then we have the aura increases ally crit rate in arena battles by 25%. So I'm going to go over the multipliers here real fast uh, when it comes to this champion's skills and how they actually relate to the rest of the defensive-based champions. So here we go. We have the damage skill multipliers here. Fortis A3 is a 3.5. His Fortis A2 is a 3.8. I brought Kandrafon in here just to show you the difference uh, between the two since they're so like you know closely related looks-wise. Uh, Helicath has a 3.8 on his A2. So the same exact multiplier. Now what's kind of weird about the kit is you're going to have to basically do the fear with somebody else or this guy is going to have to set himself up. Now, the problem I see with setting himself up is the full turn meter. You know, he's going to have to go through the full turn to get back around to it, unless you uh, boost him in some way. But, um, like, Rule the Huntsmaster, for example, has an A3 where he can place the hex, get a 50% turn meter boost to help him go into the A2, which is nukes all the enemies. Like, that's kind of a better way to do that. I don't really like a champion who's going to set themselves up, especially inside the arena. Because what you're going to have is a champion that, um, you know, probably doesn't get around to their second turn a lot of times, especially on a go second team. Uh, so that's a lot of turns to be waiting around the arena because the arena is very fast fights. It usually doesn't last uh, much longer than two, three, four turns. So it's a little weird. Uh, now, you're going to have a, a problem, I think, when you have to start building team compositions that basically have an increased defense buff, a true fear or fear AoE, a like buff strip of some sort, like Prince Kaimar, and weaken and decrease defense. Getting all that in one team is going to be very difficult. Even if there were a team composition that could like satisfy all those needs and give you everything, how hard would it be for like everybody in the game to have that you know, access to those champions and have that team composition available to themselves who pulls this champion here. It'd be very difficult. I find his synergies to be a little weird. Could you use someone like Leorius the Proud to set up the true fear on the, the A3 and then drop the weekend? Yeah. But then like you bring Leorius the Proud usually to be your main nuker. So like what what would this guy's purpose be if you have a Leorius to set him up? You know? Uh you bring a Harvester Jack, a little more tanky champion. Um, Mashald probably would not be a good option because he'd die really fast. Maybe in Doom Tower or something like that. Um, Venus can do a buff strip, a weaken, and a decreased defense, but that's only if Cupidus is on the same team. And it's a 50% chance to go from the buff strip to the weaken and the decreased defense. It's going to be very interesting on how you build this team composition to get this guy to work. But let's go over the uh, multipliers again here real fast. So the, the way that this A3 damage increases by 10% every time a fear or true fear gets placed on an enemy, the math comes out basically like if you get one fear on one enemy in the arena and you use the A3, it's going to be a 3.85 multiplier. That means it's only added 0.35. At the A2 level, you're going to get 4.2. Then with uh, one resist up here, you're going to get 4.5. So that basically means that three fears have landed within one round and you're nuking afterwards. So that means like you weren't able to strip a stone skin or something off somebody. Um, I think this is additive. That means it, so the more fears and true fears that get added in the round, like say against a boss or something, the more damage that A3 is going to be outputting over and over and over again. Um, up until basically, I mean, we get up here where we have 10 fears on like spiderlings, for example, in one turn, the nuke would be a seven multiplier. So basically what happens is every 10 fears you add in a round is going to add 3.5 to it. You know, the first A3 with no fears is 3.5. You're able to add 10 more fears in the round, you're going to get that doubled to 7. And then if you did 10 more fears in the round, you're going to add another 3.5. So basically you can keep adding that 3.5, that 100% each time you add 10 more fears per round, technically speaking. Uh, so that could very much uh, take him into this astronomical you know, levels of damage here. Um, but let's take a look at how it compares. You have uh, three champions here that are defense-based that have extra damage capabilities on their passives. Um, you got Fortis, Ragash, and Staltus. Staltus Dragonbane damage increases by 5% for each debuff in the target. 
and Ragash inflicts 20% more damage against targets whose defense is lower than this champion's defense. Basically, if you get one fear on a champion in the arena, he's going to be nuking for less than Rosin's A3, or Wurlam, or Staltis, or Tatura even. So when it comes to uh, two fears, we've got, now we're up to Tatura level damage, Staltis level damage. And then we have the A3 also ignores 30% of defense for targets under fear and true fear. So that applies for every single target individually, unlike this guy's over here. So that kind of puts him on Staltus's level uh, when it comes to Staltus's A2 and Ragash's A2. And then when we get to three fears or even four fears, we've now breached Ragash's and Staltus's damage. 4.5, 5, and then 4.9. That takes it up to Solus. Now, Solus is over here nuking for 4.9 with nothing. There's no conditions, period. He just nukes. Bam, hard. Uh, Fortis, we're going to have to have five, you know, applications of fear to get a 5.25 modifier. So now he's beating Solus in the Doom Tower, technically speaking on paper. Funda is a six-point multiplier, the three times two. So it hits twice for three, bam, bam, on the A3. <clears throat> We're not to Trunda levels yet. Uh, we're going to have to go to the Spider or the Doom Tower or also have multiple turns or multiple applications of AoE Fear onto champions to start to bring them up beyond Trunda's damage uh, into Hefrak's level of damage. So 10 Fears, 10 Fears doubles as 3.5 to 7. That's close to Hefrak. Hefrak lands both attacks. It's 3.6 times 2. So Fortis with 20 fears, gets up to a 10.5. So we can see, like, the more the round goes, say, for example, Doom Tower, the more damage that A3 is going to be doing. But you probably want to be bringing some more champions with them, like Leorius, uh, you know, Harvester Jack, Mashald, to apply more fears, so you get more damage in those nukes. So far, he looks very, very promising on paper. We'll have to see how it you know, actually applies. Uh, if you know me, I love Kanderfon. He's on a lot of my teams. I use him in a go second uh, capacity. So I think if you get this champion, um, you know, he looks a lot like a, a Kanderfon here when it comes to staying alive. But when, when it comes to defensive base nukers, you can tell there's a lot of other people that have advantages over him until you start getting this multiplier to stack up. And getting that multiplier to stack up, I mean, is it really worth it? Like if you pull Solus over here, obviously Solus like this comes right out the package doing more. But at the same time, this guy could technically ramp up to do more than Solus if the conditions are met. Now, I'm not sure necessarily that uh, I love the kit, but it does look cool and promising. Now, when it comes to like team compositions, like I said, it's going to be hard to uh, build a team for them. Like somebody like Prince Kaimar could be a lead. Um, you know, anybody that's defense up could be good. Be, um, Athrala, so many champions. Uh, I'm trying to think, you know, just in my head, like how I'd build this team out. Maybe you do something like Prince Kaimar, Lydia... Harvester Jack or Leorius the Proud and then uh, Fortis here. Something like that, maybe. We'll explore those team compositions if I ever pull this guy. Um, You know, definitely seems interesting. Gonna have to try this guy out for sure. Now, really, I wish I had access to the test server. Need more subs, though. You know what I'm saying? Shout out to all you guys that are subbed. Love you guys. Appreciate you. Over to Tomo. We have a Epic Force Affinity Support Shadowkin Champion. Looks very cool. Very ninja-like. Stab and grab an A1. Attacks one enemy. Has a 30% chance of stealing one random buff from the target. Bamboozle A2. Attacks all enemies. Has a 75% percent chance of placing a 50 percent decrease attack debuff for two turns it goes up to 100 percent chance it's always a very good uh, ability for faction wars and thickest thieves places a counter-attack buff on a target ally for two turns places a counter-attack buff for three turns instead of the allies from the shadowkin faction wooji talking to you then fills the turn meters of all allies by 15 percent and places a 30 percent increase crit damage buff on all allies for two turns also places a 30 percent increase crit rate buff for two turns on allies from the shadowkin faction that is a six turn cooldown four turns when booked so definitely looks like a very cool ability here for faction wars uh Brethren passive increases all heals and turn meter fill effects by 20% when used on allies from the Shadowkin faction. There are multiple champions in a team of this skill, only one will activate. And the aura is increases ally speed and faction crypts by 24%. Yeah, if, if she ain't built for the faction crypts, I don't know what she's built for. You know, you got the A2 right here with the decrease attack. You got the steal the random buff. You got the counter attack. And then all this extra cool stuff that happens when you're, you know, dealing with the Shadowkin faction. Basically, the aura right here that seals the deal. Ally speed and faction crypts by 24%. I mean, she seems absolutely 
absolutely amazing. If you're having trouble beating uh, the Shadowkin faction crypt, stage 21 has one of the hardest bosses in the entire game when it comes to that stuff. Uh, he hits super hard, though so this champion can definitely help you out. And we got Prosecutor. Now, Prosecutor, you're going to have to get these ones basically to fuse a champion. So, uh, Rare, Spirit, Attack, High Elf. These champions, I don't have high hopes for them to being uh, beneficial or useful. Um, there's so many champions that are rares in this game that aren't worth leveling up. And this champion might be another one of them. Uh, there's very, very few I'd actually recommend taking a 60. Like Coldheart, for example. Uh, Sap Initiative. Attacks one enemy two times. Each hit has a 20% chance of decreasing the target's turn meter by 10%. Halt Proceedings A2 attacks all enemies, has a 50% chance of placing a 30% decrease speed debuff for two turns. Halt Proceedings sounds exactly like something Amber Heard's lawyer would do. Then Prosecute attacks one enemy three times, places a 50% increased accuracy buff in this champion for two turns before attacking. Stop right there, criminal scum! Nobody breaks the law on my watch! Each hit has a 30% chance of placing a 100% heal reduction debuff for two turns. Well, the way Prosecutor's kit plays out, he looks like a low-level Fire Knight champion. So someone you'd use for the Fire Knight when it comes to placing that heal reduction, just in case you don't have no one better. So I would say that, yeah, this is a Fire Knight champion for sure when it comes to low-level Fire Knight dungeon. So attacks on the enemy two times and then you know, decreases the target's turn meter by 10%. This is most definitely a Fire Knight champion. Well, that's it for today's video. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. If you guys did, please like, comment, and subscribe. I'll see you guys in the next one. You guys have a great day. Take it easy. Peace.